4.6, we're going to perform operations with complex numbers. If you've ever wondered why you couldn't take the square root of a negative number, don't worry about it anymore. We're going to learn how to today. We'll be introducing the idea of an imaginary number. And square root of negative 1 is defined as lowercase i. That means it's an imaginary number. If we end up seeing something like i squared, which we will, that really means square root of negative 1 squared, which really means negative 1. So the first time in our lives, we can now square something and get a negative answer. Before that was impossible with imaginary numbers, it's possible. So let's see what this looks like. We're going to solve this equation just like we did any other equation in the last lesson. Subtract 11 from both sides, no problem. Divide both sides by 2, no problem. Take the square root of both sides, no problem, kind of. Except we have a negative number inside our square root. All that means is we do the same thing we did if there wasn't a negative number inside the square root. Which means we'll say plus or minus. 2 square root of 6, verify that on your own, but because of that negative on the inside of the square root, we put a little i right on the outside of the square root. That's the only difference in today's square root simplifications. So go ahead and try a few of these on your own, or you can do that later. Adding complex numbers which means a number with an imaginary part is just as easy as you'd want it to be. We add the real pieces and we add the imaginary pieces. Same thing works for subtraction. Let's take a look at what I mean. I'm told to write the expression as a complex number in standard form. So I see 8 plus 5 is 13. Negative i, positive 4i, that means negative 1 and positive 4 makes 3i. Done. Subtraction works the same. We just have to distribute that minus sign. 7 and negative 3 makes 4. Negative 6 minus a minus, which really makes a plus. So they cancel out. We're just left with 4. Or we could distribute the minus sign as we go. Makes it a little easier, maybe. And then combine the real 10 and 6 and the imaginary. 7 and 4, negative 7 and 4. So addition and subtraction works pretty nicely. Division and multiplication are a little bit trickier, but don't worry, you don't have to worry about something that hard until at least a couple slides down. All right, now you can pause the video and try some of these on your own, or you can do them later. So go ahead and read this problem, pause the video and read it, see if you can figure out what's going on. I'll admit, this one was a little confusing for myself even, but I was able to muddle through it. Hopefully so can you. What I understood in this problem is I've got three of these little squiggly lines, which is an inductor, and the way I represent an inductor is that number times i. So that gives me... 3i. Next I see this little jaggedy line which represents a resistor and the way I represent a resistor is with just using the number. In this case that's 5. And then I saw these two little parallel lines and that represents a capacitor and the way we're going to represent a capacitor is with negative that number times i. In this case negative 4i asking us to find the impedance, and this impedance is the sum of the impedances for the individual components. And the individual components for 3i plus 5 minus 4i. All together it looks like we have negative i plus 5 for our total impedance. I'm not super familiar with the terms here, so I'm not really sure what a resistor, an inductor, and a capacitor is. But even not knowing what those things mean, I'm able to piece together from the chart what numbers I want to add together. 
Now we're going to multiply. I told you you wouldn't have to worry about it for at least a couple slides. Multiplying starts off. Multiplying is not too bad. Starts off exactly like you'd want it to. 4i times negative 6, negative 24i. 4i times positive i is 4i squared. The part where this gets tricky is we don't want the i squared. If you go back to the very first slide where I told you what i squared was equal to, you might remember that i squared is always equal to negative 1. So this is really negative 4 minus 24i. And you have to go that extra step to be considered done. Same thing is going to happen when we use FOIL or distributive property on binomials. We're going to multiply, 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 and multiply. And the only one that really gives us problems is the negative 14 i squared. One thing I remember is when I see an i squared, that really just tells me to change the sign. So negative 14 i squared is the same thing as positive 14. Nothing else changes, except I'm not really done because I haven't combined like terms. For instance, negative 36 and positive 14 make negative 22. 63 and 8 make 71. Then I'm done. So multiplying is definitely harder than addition or subtraction, but it's still manageable. All that's left is dividing. You might remember conjugates from last lesson. They're coming back. Remember, i is a square root of negative 1, so we don't want a negative. We don't want a square root on the bottom of the fraction. So we've got our 7 plus 5i, our 1 minus 4i. We've got to multiply by the conjugate to get rid of the square root on the bottom. If you remember, a conjugate means change the sign on the square root part only. And then multiply. Go ahead and pause the video, see if you get the same thing as me. couple notes on the denominator. Notice I left out the middle terms. I'm allowed to do that because I know that when I multiply by a conjugate, what happens to the middle terms? They disappear. Also, I wrote plus 16 instead of minus 16 because negative 4 times positive 4 is negative 16 i squared. And I know i squared means change the sign. All that's left now is to clean this up. I've got to collect like terms and we're done. Maybe reduce at which point we're done. At this point you can pause the video, try these on your own, or try them later. Example 6 is the easiest example of the lesson. Plotting complex numbers. Let's talk about how we do that. Plotting a complex number means instead of calling this the x-axis, we're going to call it the real, and instead of the y-axis, we're going to call it imaginary. So if I'm going to plot 3 minus 2i, I go 3 on the real axis, negative 2 on the imaginary. That's it for part A. Go ahead and pause the video and try to plot these other three points, label them B, C, and D. Wouldn't it be nice if math was always that easy? One more topic today. Absolute value of a complex number. The way we find absolute value... We remember that absolute value means distance, and we plot the point, just like we did in the last example, and then we can use Pythagorean theorem to figure out how far that is from the origin, because absolute value always means how far are we from the origin. We don't have to actually plot the point and graph it, though. We can use the formula. I do expect you to memorize the formula. It's really just a Pythagorean theorem square root of a squared plus b squared, where a is the real part and b is the imaginary part. So let's take a look at the example. Find the absolute value of negative 4 plus 3i. I'll set this up before I have you pause the video. Take the negative 4 squared plus the 3 squared. Notice I didn't write i at all. And we're going to simplify that. Go ahead and do that. And try the same thing for part B. And hopefully you got what I got. You can verify this by plotting the points on a graph and using Pythagorean theorem. 
At this point, you can pause the video and try these on your own, or you can do that later. Other than that, we are done with this lesson.